one of humanity's most greatest and essential assets for countering the ongoing chaos. The javelins were designed for the sake of humanity progression and take on the perilous world of the anthem. These airtight suits are well equipped and crafted for the harshest environments, and many threats and terrors that the anthem is known to produce. Capable of providing super strength to the user, increased physical speed, short flights, underwater breathing apparatus, and superior defense, and more depending on what javelin you pick. They can overcome the harshest obstacles that many standard humans can't do. But where did they come from and how are they crafted? First, no, we must look back many years ago to the darkest path of humanity, where hope was a non-existence and life was barely survivable for many. The javelins were created by the legendary engineer and mastermind to many technological wonders of today, Arden Vassa. Created in a time where humanity was at its weakest and enslaved by the Urgoth, who savagely used humans for the amusements. These suits were created to counter the savage outside world, but also to overcome the notorious Urgoth, who had a large control on humanity. Because of Arden's key knowledge in forged blueprints and ember manipulation, he managed to craft the very first javelin for Helena Tarsus within five days, which allowed Helena to take on Urgoth head on and also inspired the other Legion of Dawn members to take up arms and suits. It was a long and bloody war fought on all fronts for the Legion who were desperate to break away from the Urgoth and kill the very masters who saw them as only slaves, nothing more. In the end, they killed the Urgoth's masters and drove away the rest who appeared to be in hiding, awaiting for a chance to reclaim what is theirs. The Javelins at this point became an icon of freedom, protection and exploration to the many, which led to an uprising in Lancer users who wanted to follow in the same footsteps that Helena once did. Arden Vassar became a legend and hero from his work, and never stopped after the threat of the Urgo for during off. After the breakup of the Legion, he went off to develop more technological wonders for humanity, which led to the creation of Antium, a well-known and highly fortified city, which by the sound of it, seems to be a major important icon for all of humanity to go to. Now in today's society, his knowledge has been passed down throughout the world, where new javelins have been created to keep up to date with advancing technology, but also provide more defense when exploring the outside walls. Today's javelins are crafted slightly different than the ones compared many years ago, but still follow the same design principle like they did in the past, although we don't know if the materials used are the same from years ago. We know that the embers were used to create an interface called the gateway, which allowed the connection between the human mind and the anthem to be built, and further allowed them to be interfaced with current technology that javelins use. This would allow them to interface straight away without a key, and this is where the signet key comes in that the vast majority of locals have. The signet acts as a bridge once connected to a suit and thus allows them to use a suit freely. Without a key, they won't be able to use the exosuit or generally any of his features. At the same time, we also know that signets are tuned to single users, so if an unknown or foreign key is used on, let's say, a personal javelin, then there's a high chance it won't operate 100%. This is probably a built-in failsafe to prevent thefts, but I could see a black market with the regulators being active on the idea. Next we have Corvium, a rare material from Titan that only appear when they die, and known as well to be used by the Legion of Dawn to craft their javelins, which I would guess is a very strong and modified material which has unique properties. Perfect for javelins or weaponry. And then we have the standard scrap metal used for building javelins main parts. This is as far as we go in terms of knowing all the materials used for crafting them, since nothing is recorded, but I know there's more to it than this. Now currently we know that the Colossus Javelin was the first javelin to be used out on the field, and has a relative history behind it, from first hand experience from Helena Tarsis. The Storm Javelin only came into existence long after Helena's death and only once the Dominion were created. The other two javelins, so Ranger and Interceptor, are unknown as to when they were created, as not much information is available to indicate their creation date or time. Although the Interceptor was probably created at a later time by Corvus, after the dispatch of the Legion and after Helena's death, and the Ranger seemed more likely to be created in the pre Legion of Dawn days for standard foot soldiers for its flexible role. But this is unknown, although there are a few statues located around the world that seem to support some of the design decisions that the Ranger also has. In our case, today's javelins are designed around specific areas of expertise that they would succeed well in, while also having disadvantages in them to sort of like RPG characters with varying stats. The Ranger offers flexible stats and is the best for new and veteran lancers to use, 
although not so great for taking on large groups and prefers one on one fights. The Colossus is the damage dealer and soak of the three, and great for ad clearing or boss slaying, although slower movement. The Interceptor is like a bandit which focuses on hit and runs and great for clearing the field in melee ranges, although weaker in health and has more strength in melee than weaponry. And the Storm is like the Grand Wizard, you can dish out elemental damage one after another with a flexible shield for extra protection, although like the Interceptor, suffers in low shield and main expertise in elemental combos on long range engagements. As you can see, all the javelins are designed around specific roles that best suit them, but also best suited for pairing up with other javelins for larger and effective communication, and where they can also cover from other areas that other javelins fail in. That and the many modifications added to them allows them to be designed however a Lancer wants, as long as they have the right idea to go about it. But while we already knew this, one question on a lot of people's minds are how are javelins created in this world? as they are quite a mystery considering how advanced they are. Even though we know that Arden Vassa was the one to create a blueprint as a whole. The thing is these exosuits aren't just simple suits of armour with boosters attached to them, and a weapon to boot. What I find incredible is that these exosuits provide a lot, and I mean a lot of features that would only be seen in sci-fi based books or movies etc, that focus on space exploration or exploring worlds or areas where the conditions are too severe for human life, which kind of does fit the bill for us. Everything about them from simple human features, to the weaponry, to the built-in boosters, to even the cockpit don't seem to make sense for Anthem's humans who are still currently behind in technology. So let's break down what we know. The suits have the ability to allow the user to hover or fly over short distances with built-in boosters that over time can overheat. Since these don't seem to rely on a fuel source of any kind, it might be an ignition system instead, which probably relies on Ember to activate it. This might make the most sense considering how we're able to move and stop midair without no problems. Next, the armor of the javelin seems to be quite thick, but light for the user, which allows the user to take a number of hits and damages without damaging the user in sight. Although this is of course first protected by a force field type substance that absorbs the vast majority of damages first, before reaching the second layer. With these add-ons, they can still be easily pierced by a strong enough force capable of bypassing the shield and arm as a whole, akin to the Heart of Rage cutscene where that one Lancer was unfortunately crushed by an Ash Titan. At the same time, the armor is placed into specific areas of the body to where protection is most likely required, like the head, chest, legs and arms, but also leaving gaps between the main focus points to allow freedom of movement similar to most modern day and older day heavy armor. They are also capable of allowing users to breathe underwater with built-in breathing apparatus, but only for a limited time. They use built-in boosters as a underwater propulsion to allow them to navigate and traverse the waters, although their speed is limited and can be pushed to be faster. By the sounds of it, it sounds like the javelin has a hybrid booster built into them, allowing it to traverse underwater and in the air, which is remarkable for a single suit to handle because of the sudden change in the environment. In fact, I'm surprised the suit doesn't break down upon entry from the sheer speed it goes, or causes some kind of shock to the user upon impact from high drops, although the undersuit probably has help with absorbing some of it. If the suits are this well designed and sturdy, then it's possible for them to survive extreme temperatures or even possibly space, although that's quite a stretch to make with no indication of javelins surviving a sub-zero space to begin with, but the materials used for them could possibly survive it. One thing to be aware is that the javelins, although vastly seen by a lot of people in the forts and outside in the wild, they are in fact quite limited in numbers to everyday users because of the limited resources required to build them. Everything in the world is handmade and not automated by factories. Because of limited resources, only a few are chosen to man and use them outside the fort. It's also noted that because of such severity in building them, that many freelancers pass down their javelins from generation to generation to cut back on building ones from scratch. Plus, any damaged parts can be easily fixed via scrap parts. However, one thing not explained is that it doesn't explain whether this is based on just our javelin type, or in fact every javelin out in the field. As our javelins are heavily customized with components and built-in weapons, while the Sentinel javelins for example don't have these features, and in fact seem to be a downgraded version of the Ranger class, and yet we see plenty of them in sheer numbers. So this may be limited to one group of javelin users rather than the whole, depending on customization required, 
since more materials being used probably require more maintenance over a simple sentinel suit, which only needs to require armor to be active and function for the user. To me, this seems more like a downside for javelins and for humanity as a whole, as lack of materials on their end mean they can't progress fast enough for providing more protection for humans, which might make them more vulnerable to future attacks. This also means that developing new technology will come at a slower rate, to which depending on how the world evolves, may be too late if something like a cataclysm or two appears and wipes everyone out. But this isn't all doom and gloom, as these exosuits are among the most technological advanced items that humanity have ever created, even though they lag behind in other areas such as transport, mass production, medicine, etc. Still, we can't ignore such a feat that today's society is trying to replicate with sure signs of breakthrough one day. Plus, over time they may manage to craft a system that allows them to build javelins faster than what they deal with, with also hopeful signs of them creating new and even more powerful javelins to counter the ongoing future threats. So that's the end of the lore for the creation of javelins and some theorizing as well. I hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed the video then do please leave a like, a sub and share for more for future videos. But once again, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.